You have reached the Corona DSO. 592 exchange. Thank you. IPI, the Netflix, Spotify, and so on and so forth. And if you are hearing this somehow on Spotify, you know, sometimes it gets sucked up into Spotify, please do disconnect from Spotify and cancel your account. Don't give the RAA or Spotify any of your money, time, or mind share. It's important to keep our minds under our own control and to have the media that comes into our mind not be under the control of those who would seek to enslave us. And so the important news of the week, of course, is going on right now in Syria. What is going on in Syria? I do not have an access to anyone in Syria on the ground. Like the rest of you, I am forced to turn to major media outlets for the most part. There's language barriers, there's a half the world away going in between us and finding out what's actually going on in Syria. But I think it's worth pointing out that there is something going on in Syria today, uh, over, the, over the last 48 hours or so. There's a particular scene in the movie Threads, if you've ever encountered the movie Threads, that talks about... An, I think it might even be Syria, where the United States and Russia are in this kind of locked into this situation where tension is escalating and escalating and there's more and more military movement and things are getting more and more tense and at some point during that movie, the Americans and the Russians start shooting at each other and at that point, that's when the shit really hits the fan. And in this particular case, that is what was happening over the past 48 hours. Americans and Russians did come into a firefight. And it's been, uh, like, I looked right before the show, and I could not find anyone talking about this other than, of course, the media that was doing its job properly this time and actually covering it. Now, it's still pretty small scale. There are Russian forces on one side present, and there are rebels that they're supporting, or at least the government side that they're supporting. It's kind of hard to tell at this point, really, who's rebel slash government slash legitimate authority in that particular part of the world. But the Russians certainly have picked up their particular quote-unquote legitimate authority there and are supporting them and have troops on the ground, planes in the air, and so on and so forth. And there are zones that the Americans and the Russians have apparently agreed to at least according to this media report here, that can stay on one side of the line, the Russians stay on the other side of the line, and as long as everyone kind of behaves themselves and is where they're supposed to be, then there's the only people getting killed are the helpless civilians who are getting bombed or shot or mined or what have you. Until yesterday. Yesterday, quote, and this is from MSNBC News. So this is a Microsoft news station. So hard to say exactly how accurate this is, but quote, Pentagon sending troops to Syria after clashes between U.S. and Russian military. Troops are meant to discourage Russians from crossing into eastern area where U.S. coalition and Syria Democratic Forces operated, say officials. So pausing there for a minute. When they say Syrian Democratic Forces, they 
mean like Islamist <laughs> radicals that the Americans are allied with that are maybe not Dawah al-Islamia, but uh, certainly not who you would probably imagine when you think of democratic forces, like this isn't the force of democracy, this is a force of a particular faction who happens to be fighting on the American side in this particular conflict. So it's worth pointing that out. And the other thing, like even like at the headline level here, this has been going on long enough that the Americans are responding. The news didn't mention the first bit where a, there are clashes going on. It was just, oh, and now the Americans are responding so we can like know what's going on because the response takes place in a country with a at least somewhat embedded press capable of talking about it. Uh, continuing on. Washington, quote, the Pentagon is deploying a small number of U.S. troops to Syria after a series of escalating encounters between the U.S. and Russian militaries, according to three U.S. defense officials. The troops and vehicles will serve as a show of presence to discourage Russian military from crossing into the eastern security area where U.S. coalition and SDF forces operate, the official said. The additional troops will include six Bradley fighting vehicles and fewer than 100 soldiers operating in northeast Syria on a 90-day deployment. I.e., these are already soldiers in Syria. These are already soldiers that are part of the theater of war already. It's not that they're being sent in from the United States, but it is an escalation, and it is a direct escalation aimed at Russia specifically. So that's important to note. Quote, a U.S. official said these actions and reinforcements are a clear signal to Russia to adhere to mutual deconfliction processes. Ooh, there's a Norwellian term. wonder what that exactly means. It probably means something like sit down, Russia. Like... <laughs> Calm your tits, right? <laughs> Continuing on. And for Russia and other parties to avoid unprofessional, unsafe, and provocative actions in Northeast Syria. And you can pause. Guarantee <laughs> that the unprofessional, unsafe, and provocative actions probably came from the American side. I mean, don't get me wrong, the Russian side is probably doing the same thing too. But generally, when they start talking in that kind of language, when they start accusing the other side of doing something like that, they're also guilty of it as well. So it's worth pointing that out because you can bet that MSNBC would never do such a thing. Continuing on, quote, while the U.S. military and Russian forces have come into contact at checkpoints along Highway M4 in Syria throughout 2020, on August 17, U.S. and Syria's defense forces came under small arms fire after passing through a checkpoint near Tal al-Zahab, Syria. The U.S. and SDF had permission from the pro-Syrian regime forces manning the checkpoint, but then began to take fire from unidentified forces nearby. I.e., this is a civil war, and there are lots of people who can be basically stirring things up at this point. Dawa al Islamia is still, I mean, they're kind of on the defensive and on the run and all that sort of thing, but they're still in the area, they're still operating, and so they could have been that like third party shot from the, uh, what, what is it, the bell tower or whatever. That isn't as much of a, an issue. I mean, you're in a civil war, these sorts of things happen, but continuing on, quote, the U.S. and SDF returned fire, which is kind of what you'd expect for a, a group of soldiers to do in a war zone when fired upon, like the fire back and hope that everyone calms down at that point, but continuing on, and did not suffer any casualties. The U.S. officials said the small arms fire likely came from Syrian and Russian forces. Pure conjecture, pure conjecture. I mean, maybe they did, maybe it was a rogue soldier, maybe it was a American embedded person in the Russian army, there's lots of things, like that sort of thing can be. So, I mean, it's worrying that the Russians and Americans have, have soldiers in a Vietnam at least like situation shooting at each other, but again, it's that particular conflict has been going on for years now, and so it's not that surprising when that sort of thing happens. Continuing on, oh, quote, a most serious incident this year occurred several days later when seven U.S. soldiers were injured by, or when Russian military vehicles sideswiped a U.S. military vehicle in North East Syria. Three US officials said the Russian vehicles intentionally collided with the Americans and then several Russian helicopters flew low and fast on the scene, which one official said was extremely provocative. The Russian vehicles were outside of their agreed upon operating area without notice, the official said i.e. they're basically just buzzing them and trying to keep them on guard and that is aggressive and provocative but it's kind of the way Russia has been approaching this particular conflict and generally just like testing the borders of not just the United States everywhere where the Russian and American forces are kind of located but also things like Canada like they've been flying planes up in our skies and right up to our area of control at least of, of the Canadian government and then the Canadian government sends a fighter pilot up to intercept them and tells them to go away, and then they do. So that sort of thing has been going on for years and years. It's 
provocative and it's kind of uh, dangerous to be, you know, it's, it's playing with fire, but it's still, again, nothing new on that side. Quote, U.S. Central Command spokesperson Captain Bill Urban characterized these actions as deliberately provocative and aggressive, which, I mean, that's his job to say that, so that's still in the normal uh, snap. In, in an exclusive interview with NBC News, the commander of U.S. Central Command decried the Russian behavior and lack of professionalism on the ground, saying it got us into a dangerous situation where a Russian ground patrol actually came into the eastern security area, an area they were not or authorized to be in. We were very lucky that our guys on the ground were able to keep that from turning into a larger incident. That was a concerning moment. Had it gone another way, we might have been in trouble there, and they may have been in trouble too. I.e., somebody screwed up on the ground, and or at least for whatever reason, they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, damn near got themselves killed, and the American military is openly saying this. Like, come on guys, be careful, because if you go in the wrong place, we'll kill you. Continuing on. The encounter was or the most provocative between the U.S. and Russia in Syria since Feb 2018, where hundreds of heavily armed Russian private military contractors equipped with tanks and artillery attacked a joint area where both U.S. and Syrian SDF forces were operating. Quote, no, this is, I mean, like, this is way more, bigger than that. Because they were mercenaries and contractors, right? Like, that was not a direct conflict between Russian forces and American forces. That was a conflict between Russian contractors and unofficial forces and American forces. So that's a, a big difference. That's like the difference between what's going on in Syria this week and what went on in the Ukraine for years, and is probably still going on to this day, where you have unofficial Russian forces that are doing the takeover of things like Crimea, but if they get killed, it's not like the Russian government has to be responsible for that, or if they kill Americans, there's no need to retaliate against Russia itself in inherent in that. I mean, everyone knows that the vacationers in Ukraine were actually Russian soldiers, but it wasn't official. It wasn't, there was no need to retaliate immediately involved with that. So the threat of escalation beyond just mercenaries fighting each other and killing each other, like it would max out at something like Vietnam Vietnam or Afghanistan, right, where you have lots of people dying on both sides of the military, but it would remain hopefully contained in a terrible and unfortunate war with lots of human tragedy involved, but not into a world war, say. Whereas when Russian and American troops are firing at each other, there is a threat for a world war coming out of that. Quote, the U.S. flew in AC-130 gunships and other attack aircraft to stop the assault, killing as many as 300 of the Russian mercenaries all believed to be working for the Wagner Group, a private mi Russian military contractor. I, again, this is like the U.S. on one side of the conflict and the Wagner Group on the other. It is a small-scale conflict, not something that can escalate very far. Quote, the U.S. continues to conduct security patrols with the SDF, and the Syrian partners are actually carrying out the majority of the tactical operations in the actual fighting, i.e., this is an American troops for the most part on the ground. It's Syrians fighting Syrians. Quote, those patrols are always conducted with our SDF partners. You'll never see a U.S. element out there moving alone. It will always have SDF affiliated with it when they move. That could be one person. That could be many people. Who knows? But, quote, the op tempo is pretty high up there. And they're pretty active, he said. The decision to add more troops to Syria comes after Trump, or the Trump administration, announced it would withdraw nearly half of the troops serving in Iraq and Afghanistan in the coming weeks. The U.S. will draw down from 5,200 in Iraq to 3,000 by the end of September and from 8,600 in Afghanistan to 4,500 by the November election. And isn't that interesting that this is actually like on the Trump side, getting closer to the promise made, promise kept sort of thing, right? Where there used to be a hell of a lot more than 3,000 U.S. soldiers in Iraq. So the fact that they're down to only 3,000 not counting mercenaries, not counting contractors, not counting supply, not counting civilians, not counting intelligence, not counting JTF, probably. And, uh, of course, not counting international partners like Canada involved in things like the JTF. But still, 3,000, starting to get close to a withdrawal of the U.S. from the Iraq, which that has been called for for many years by many people. I am one of those people that thinks that the U.S. should stay the hell out of Iraq and that they should never have invaded. But I understand if there's a disagreement there, et cetera, et cetera. But same thing with Afghanistan. Like, the fact that they're drawing down troops and they're backing away from involvement in the Middle East generally and curtailing a little bit the American empire, is that because they have drones? Is it because they can control the area effectively without a human presence? 
Is it just like purely giving territory to Russia? Is it purely attempting to make peace in the world? There's lots of things going on here. But it's interesting to note one way or another. But we constantly evaluate and reevaluate the tactical position. We make adjustments to posture designed to give the troops on the ground what they need to be better protected as they carry out their mission. Mackenzie said, therefore, I like how they frame that. It's like, we have these generals who are doing this thing to keep troops safe. That's why they're in Iraq. That's why they're in Syria. That's why they're in Afghanistan. It's because they want to be safe and comfortable, right? That, you know, these, these troops out there, that the thing that generals do is position them with the troops in mind. No, of course they don't. The generals, their job is to act strategically and position troops where there is strategic advantage in their being there. And things like having control over areas of Syria, having the ability to project force on the Russians or otherwise, to be able to accomplish regional goals, not just tactical goals, and not just local conditions, but also the entire globe. That is the, the point of the U.S. military being involved at all here. So that's kind of funny that they put it that way, but continuing on. Therefore, our forces in Syria, we believe, that give them what they need to execute the missions that they've got, and we pay keen attention to the force protection as they do that. I.e. So, again, this event, maybe it's a one-time thing. Maybe some Russian field commander lost his compass or didn't have the right map or had outdated information. You know, a lot of stuff happens in the fog of war. A lot of stuff happens on the ground. You can't really blame them for being in the wrong place at the wrong time too much. Although, again, with the provocative charging of U.S. positions generally, there's kind of a history of them doing this sort of thing just to mess with the Americans. Not necessarily to take ground, although that would probably be nice for them, but just to like keep everyone on their toes. In this case, though, it did seem to go a little bit wrong. And they, again, there was a fire exchange. Notice nobody said anyone got wounded or died here, so it was probably just fire being exchanged, hard to say. But that was yesterday. So what was the Russian response to this? The Russian response is, quote, the Russian jets bombed rebel-held Syria in heaviest strikes since ceasefires six months ago. I uh, six months ago, and this this one's from Global News, or CTV Global News. But the point here is that things had calmed down in Syria for a little bit. And even as we get closer and closer to the U.S. election, where a lot of things could happen close to the U.S. election because Trump's occupied on other things, Russia knows that it can make the Americans' current administration look bad or look good, depending on how they react. Everyone's on their toes. Everyone's getting increasingly polarized. Weird things happen before U.S. elections. And I was reading somewhere, I think it was in reference to, actually, I think it was Bangladesh, where like the, the history of conflict globally usually is coupled and correlated with the U.S. election cycle. Because when the American government stops paying attention to places, stuff happens. People make moves. Dictators invade other countries, or at least it's make big pushes in repressing their own citizens. Because they know the American government can't really react in the same way they would normally react if it wasn't so deep into the U.S. election cycle. And so it's interesting that we had this ceasefire that lasted as long as it has. in this conflict that has created tens of millions of refugees and untold number of people killed, untold number of people tortured, untold number of women raped. It's a giant human catastrophe on a huge scale, but it had calmed down for a little bit and now things are getting hot again. So quote, Syrian opposition forces said that Russian jets bombed rebel-held northwestern Syria on Sunday in the most provocative strike since a Turkish-Russian deal halted major fighting with a ceasefire nearly six months ago. Witnesses said warplanes struck western outskirts of Idlib city and that there was heavy artillery shelling in the mountainous Jabal al-Zawiya region in southern Idlib from nearby Syrian army outposts. There were no immediate reports of casualties. And they basically reiterate that it's the biggest breach of the ceasefire in a while, that it was, quote, unidentified drones also hit two rebel hell towns in the Sahel al Gab plain west of Hama province. And then they reiterate that there's this is a break in the ceasefire, but this was a deal between, quote, Turkish President Erdogan and Russia's President Vladimir Putin. Also diffused military confrontation between them after Ankara poured thousands of troops into Idlib province to hold back Russian-backed forces from new advances. I.e., Russia's basically poking at Turkey now as a response to this, which is kind of interesting on its own. 
and does this article say anything else really? Quote, witnesses say that there has been a spike in product shelling from the Syrian army outposts against Turkish bases in the last two weeks. Rebels say the Syrian army and its allied militias are, were amassing troops on front lines. Two witnesses said, and this is the the other important thing to note here, quote, a Turkish military column comprising of at least 18 armored vehicles was seen overnight entering Syria through the kafir luzon border crossing in the direction of the main base in rural Idlib. So does that go on normally we just don't hear about it? Is Turkey escalating too? Because of course Turkey is another like free moving player in this. They're not entirely allied with the US on this. They're not entirely, like it's depending what the US and Russia and the Syrian government quote-unquote government, and the rebels do, is going to determine a little bit what Turkey and the Kurds do, and so we've got the Turks, we've got the Kurds, everyone's kind of moving and things are changing right now, and so that's kind of like an important thing to note. What exactly is going on? Is any of this true? Is there even a war going on in Syria? That part is definitely true, but it's hard to tell exactly what the details are on the ground. This is the sort of thing that, like, even though it is hard to find information about, it's important because we do not want the Russians and the Americans escalating too far. Moving troops from one part of Syria to the other, still fairly mild, and still within the scope of what's been going on in Syria over the past four or five years. But we do not want Russia bringing in more troops Americans bringing in more troops, Russia escalating with more aircraft, America escalating with more aircraft. This is about the point where diplomats should be talking to both countries to get make sure everyone's calming down and that this isn't going to spin out of control, especially before the U.S. election. Trump has the interest of calming things down, obviously. Who knows what he's actually going to do. Putin has the interest of not escalating this too far, but pushing the envelope a little bit. So there is hope for a diplomatic outcome here. It's not totally out of control, but it's still a scary, scary thing to read. But that is, of course, not the only thing going on this week. One thing, actually, last week, this this show uh, was censored on Facebook. And so uh, if you may remember from this uh, show, although I am a couple of shows behind in editing and getting this particular broadcast to platforms like Buzzsprout and Mega and Stitcher and, oh God, where else am I? Oh yeah, the BitTorrent networks uh, and BitChute. Th there's a little bit of a delay still. I'm still working my way uh, the past couple of weeks. But the last show was censored. And apparently I said something about COVID that tripped the censorship wire. And despite the fact that I really didn't say anything about COVID, like I talked about masks a little bit and I didn't say that masks didn't work. I didn't say that I don't think people should wear masks. I didn't, I don't think I even said that people should wear masks. I just like expressed some curiosity about how they were going to work come winter. And that apparently is enough to get me flagged and to get my video unwatchable from a good part of the internet. So I think you still can click through and watch it, but there's this big, like scary picture over top of it saying there's false information here. Uh, basically trying to shame me for talking about masks, which is really weird because I'm probably one of the more open-minded people, at least in my life on the topic. And I'm interested in the truth of masks coming out one way or the other. And I have a thread elsewhere on Facebook where I am slowly collecting all the information about masks and COVID and uh, how good they are and all that sort of thing. And like at this point, like you could probably do a meta-analysis just on like the stuff that I link to and just like take that data and present it in a statistically valid form and make valid conclusions from it because there's well over a hundred studies that are with tens of hundred thousands of people involved that are linked to from that post. It's actually starting to get pretty impressive, I think, but it's notable that that is what's going on because apparently we can't even talk about masks, even if we're supporting them. It's just like a verboten topic all of a sudden, which is really weird on Facebook. But that's not the only thing going on. Oh, this one's in Russian. I have to translate this. This is a really cool article that I found by the woman who runs SciHub. And I'm just gonna grab her name so I can try to mispronounce it here. She's so cool. SciHub Alexandra Elbakian, if I'm pronouncing that right. Much, much love from the internet all over for creating SciHub and making it possible for people who are not going to university to still have access to academic literature. And of course, saving in principle universities millions of dollars in licensing fees for information that should be public and free anyway. Uh, this is, quote, Columbus or Holy Pirate. No, this is not Christopher C Columbus. This is another Columbus. So as I say Columbus, like try to like block out of the part of your brain that would normally associate this with Christopher. This is a much, much earlier Columbus. 
quote, one of the earliest cases of fighting copyright and intellectual property, quote unquote, dates back to the 6th century AD, or then, the pirate turned out to be Saint Columba. Google Translate uh, changes it from Columba to Columbus every once in a while. I don't know which one it actually is. It's just probably something in Latin that approximates that. Anyway, continue. Quote, a famous Irish monk and preacher. According to legend, over the course of several nights, he quietly rewrote a book that belonged to another saint, Finian. Back then, all books were copied by hand, and so it was a rather laborious task. But the book was also very rare and valuable. Historians suggest that this could be one of the rare translations of the Psalter, and I think that means the Psalms. I'm not sure. Maybe some Christian can correct me on that one. Continuing on. In the Middle Ages, many monasteries were engaged in copying books, and our saint was a special adherent of this godly work. In his biography, Saint Adaman mentions that Columba spent a lot of his time writing. According to the 15th century manuscript, Le Bar Briac, he wrote 300, or rewrote 300 books with his own hand. But such a poem was dedicated to Columba by an anonymous poet who lived in the 12th century. Quote, Tired copyist, translated from Irish by Hany Schemas, into Russian by Zalazlavsky, and then of course to English by Google Translate. Quote, My hands are tired of writing. A light pointer trembles over the sheet. But as before the pen runs, the letters are slender on the page. Flowing along the pen, streams of ink will become a stream of wisdom in the book. Abundant fruit of ink nuts on thick parchment will take root. My hands are tired of writing, but the work of the scribe is noble, for the books worthily adorned will become the wealth of wise men. End of poem. Quote, or one way or another, the owner of the book did not appreciate Columbus's works and appealed to the court of King Diarmid. Holmkill copied my book without my knowledge, he said, and I claim that the son of the book is also mine. Quote, to which Columba replied, Finian's book did not become worse after copying, and it is wrong the holy words of this book are lost, or if they create obstacles to the fact that I or someone else could write, or read, or distribute them. And I also declare that it was my right to copy it, because it was useful to me, and I wish to benefit all people without any damage to Finian or his book. Pause. Isn't it interesting how similar that argument is to the argument of today? But let's look at this a little bit. So, one, that it's a public good, that it benefits all people when we copy information, that at least for useful and creative works, that sharing them more widely creates more value in a wider sense, and that it is not damaging to the book, the physical copy of the book, to make the copy, that reading and copying use roughly the same amount of damage and wear and tear on the book. And he had the right to read the book, he just was being challenged on the right to copy it. And so that there was no loss on the part of this Finian. And of course, thirdly, that there is this possibility of the book being lost. That particular translation of the book probably has been lost. I mean, we do still have a copy of the Psalms. It is still plausible that we could lose them, but not entirely. There's a lot of copies of them out there, and digital and paper and so on and so forth, and a lot of people interested in keeping it alive. But it is because of those people who are interested in keeping it alive by copying it that it has survived, official or unofficial, sanctioned or not sanctioned. So there is a little bit of a justification there. But anyway, quote, at least this is how the trial went according to the description given in the 16th century manuscript, quote, the life of St. Columbus. It is unclear how accurately the words of the saint were conveyed ten centuries later, but in the fight against copyright, the arguments presented are relevant to this day. However, they did not convince King Diarmid, quote, the calf is a cow and the book is a copy, so the book you wrote belongs to Finian, he said. And isn't it interesting that they're using a living thing that makes copies of itself as the kind of example here, and that it is the, the physical book is seen to be kind of a child, a kind of a, a sexually produced copy, a way that the act of looking at a book and writing and transcribing it as you go, that that is the same kind of thing that life is, and that if we have ownership rights over living things, then we should have ownership rights over living books, is kind of the argument being made here. But what's not being made is the argument of what happens to the information. And that if, for example, we could say, all right, so by making this copy, this other book is the property of this Finian, then who exactly, why should Finian get a, a physical 
book out of the deal that he would not have gotten otherwise. There's, there's kind of like a missing input here. There's the input of the physical book. Now you could say, well, in order to have a calf, you, you have to feed the cow grass, and we don't generally require payment for that grass in the case of a calf is, is born. But at the same time, like it's the, the analogy, it isn't a perfect one. So there are these kind of like little gray areas in it where such criticism could probably come from. Anyway, continuing on, quote, Yet then events developed rapidly. Columbus cursed the king of Ireland, and an unjust decision served as a motive for a bloody internecine war, known in history as the, quote, Battle of Cole Ancient, unquote, in which the army lost 3,000 soldiers, while only one was killed by the Columbia family person. Hmm, side? Hmm, whatever. Quote, for provoking the war, the saint was sent into exile on the island of Iona. By an interesting coincidence, the name Jonah in Hebrew means dove, like Columbus in Latin. Quote, I must say, historians believe that the battle over the book is a legend that arose no earlier than the 12th century, since earlier sources do not mention this. But the legend is beautiful. Columba founded several monasteries that became famous for their ability to copy books, such as Duro and Kells. The monastery on Iona became one of the largest and most influential in Western Europe, and Columbus himself became the national saint of Ireland and Scotland, rivaling in popularity with Patrick himself, i.e. St. Patrick of St. Patrick's Day. Which means, why, I wonder if there is, or could have been, a St. Columbus Day. I mean, we probably long since forget about such things by now. But, I mean, the church tends to have days for saints, right? So it's kind of interesting to note that it was at least close to as popular to St. Patrick. And, I mean, everyone knows who St. Patrick is. So why don't we know who this guy is? This is a part of Irish culture and tradition. And if we're interested in having little bits of Irish culture and tradition survive in areas where there are lots of people descended from Irish stock, as and company included, that there is this kind of interesting little tidbit here. Also interesting that such a thing could lead to something like a civil war, and that it was so important, this ability to copy the Bible, or at least this important religious work, that people would be willing to kill and die for it. That's an interesting thing to note, and that they understood then, at least in the legend, how important books are. So that is kind of an interesting little tidbit there. We are getting near the end of the show. I kind of intended to cover a little bit more than this. It is worth pointing out that the leader of the official opposition here in Canada got COVID, as well as the leader of the Bloc Québécois, which I don't have his name in front of me. I'm not going to grab it. But O'Toole, the leader of the official opposition and conservative party, tested positive. This is from François Legault. He tested positive for COVID-19, and he's taking precautions, and... He's isolating in his house. This is as of September 18th, i.e. two days ago. He's not, he's got the attention of us all and he's uh, trying to not be contagious to other people. And there's a picture below of Premier Ford from Ontario sharing a beer with him. And the comment is, this is what precaution looks like or something along those lines. And there's some question of, is it just a false positive in the test? So on and so forth. But either way, it's interesting because the Conservatives have tended to be pushing against the expansion of healthcare in this country. We've got uh, O'Toole, who's now going to learn very quickly how serious uh, COVID is or isn't. And we're going to see what happens. And especially as we're coming to the speech from the throne in the next couple of days here, actually, I think it's even this week, we've got three possible people who can vote for. It. We've got O'Toole, who's not out, just out of commission, purely. We've got the leader of the Bloc Québécois, which again, I'm totally blanking on his name right now, who's out of commission entirely. He's taken his entire caucus out of commission entirely, so they can't support it. Conservatives can't support it. The NDP, Jagmeet Singh, is he going to support the Liberals again and trash the reputation of the NDP even further by being the one party that bites the bullet and supports the Liberals and keeps an election from happening? Or at least keeps Trudeau from going to the Governor General and asking for something like an election? I mean, it is possible that Jagmeet Singh could do something really unorthodox and like uh, go to the two opposition parties and form like a weird conservative NDP coalition. I can't see him doing that. Or even doing something like just like an NDP block coalition and then having the conservatives agree to just like chill out and not vote against their throne speech or something. Things like that are possible right now. Not very thinkable, but logically possible. But it's, it's going to be an interesting week in the, the federal political level because I don't think anyone really wants an election right now. Anyone. Uh, uh, like, except for maybe the conservatives. Maybe. 
But everyone, I think, understands that an election during a p- pandemic is going to be a giant mess, and it's going to spread COVID, and so we'll see if that actually happens. But that has been the show for the week, so if you have anything you'd like me to talk about, or any Creative Commons music, or any Twitch channels that play Creative Commons content or music that we can raid, please get in touch, because I'm interested in sharing information and sharing Creative Commons and free culture music on this show and helping other Twitch channels because this is broadcast on Twitch, twitch.tv slash themusicgod1, so we can raid other channels and direct people from this show to them. So uh, other than that, just as another reminder, there's a subscribestar.com slash jeff-cliff that you can use to support this broadcast so I can do things like keep up with editing it and have interesting guests and so on. And with that, I will end with the goodbye song. See you all next week.